Welcome you all for another video on acute medicine. So today what we are going to discuss is rather the continuation of the previous video where we discussed about management of acute complications after a myocardial infarction. So you, you might remember the same patient, Mr. Bandar, a 55 year old male admitted to a &E with ischemic chest pain for three hours duration. So he had an inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction but since the PCI capable center was already occupied, we had to thrombolyze him. And the thrombolysis was successful. And as the house officer, you receive this patient to your ward HDU in the afternoon. Right. Again, this is a successful thrombolysis. <coughs> patient is pain-free, vital parameters are stable, and ECG shows improvement of ST elevations by more than 50%. So you get a call in the midnight, doctor, Mr. Bandara, the patient who was thrombolyzed in the afternoon, he's not doing well. His pulse rate is 30 beats per minute and blood pressure is 70 by 40. Yes, <clears throat> this is a medical emergency. A post my patient with symptomatic bradycardia. Pulse rate is 30 and blood pressure is 70 by 40. So as always what you are doing, you need to rush to the patient and to attend to this medical emergency. Well, are you surprised? Are you surprised to see a severe bradycardia in a patient with the inferior MI? Well, answer is no. Because if you look at the <clears throat> blood supply of the heart, the inferior MI, the culprit vessel is the right coronary artery. And the right coronary gives the SA nodal artery, SA nodal branch, which supplies the AV, sorry, SA node, as well as it gives another branch, which supplies the AV node. So the right coronary is the main blood vessel supply, the SA node and the AV node in vast majority of the patients. Right. So you're not surprised. This is, some, this is a complication that you might anticipate. So you rush to the patient and as always, airway, breathing and circulation. So discussing airway, breathing is not the scope of this lecture. So let's assume you talk to the patient and patient says, He's feeling a bit dizzy. So his airway is patent and his breathing is all right. But his blood pressure is 70 by 40 and he has cerebral hypoperfusion. Right. So what's your initial management? Well, the most important thing is to restore the blood supply to the brain. So you might lower the head end of the bed if the patient is already been propped up. And then you will assess the rhythm in the cardiac monitor until you get the patient, until you get a 12 lead ECG for this patient. And if the patient's saturation is low, if the patient is hypoxic, you can give some oxygen. So the initial management, lower the head dent, connect the patient to a cardiac monitor to look at the cardiac rhythm. And thirdly, if the patient is having hypoxia, give some oxygen. Well, now we have done the 12 lead ECG. So these ECGs, this type of ECG pattern can be commonly seen in these patients. So the first ECG, you see a P wave followed by a QRS complex and a T wave, but the rate is very low. So this is an ECG of a sinus bradycardia, which can happen after inferior MI. And then this ECG, this shows a rate two, two to one AV block. And then this ECG shows a complete heart block. So you can have sinus bradycardia and you can have first degree heart block, but which does not cause bradycardia, but higher degree heart blocks, two to one block, three to one block and complete heart block can happen after an inferior myocardial infarction. Right, the initial management is to try with atropine. So in the ward, you have atropine vials which carries 0.6 milligrams of atropine. So you can repeat every five minutes up to three milligrams of atropine to see what the response is, right? And if the response to atropine is poor, you can consider starting an isoprenaline infusion. The starting dose could be 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 microgram per kg per minute. Sometimes you can consider dopamine infusion or epinephrine infusion to get the heart rate up and to get the blood pressure up, right? So first line would be to give atropine, 
then you can consider isoprenaline, dopamine, or epinephrine as a second life. But sometimes, particularly in inferior mice with higher degree heart blocks, atropine might not work. Isoprenaline might not give you the expected outcome. So then you might have to resort for a temporary pacing. Right? So I'm going to briefly discuss about how to pace the patient. Right. So in medical boards, we have two types of pacing. So we can go for a transcutaneous pacing or for a transvenous pacing. And transcutaneous pacing is something that you all should be familiar with and you all should be able to do in an emergency setting. So I'm going to discuss in detail about transcutaneous briefing and then to touch briefly about the transvenous pacing. Right. So in transcutaneous pacing, the most important thing is you apply the pads, the pacing pads of the defibrillator appropriately. So easily you can go for an anterior lateral pacer pad placement where you uh, apply these two pads in these positions. One is in the just lateral to the sternum and one at the apical area. Or else you can go for an anterior posterior pacer pad placement. This is a bit technically difficult to apply this thin and position patient, but this gives a better pacing compared to the anterior lateral pacing. Okay. And once you have applied the pace, pacer pads, I mean, this is where you give some electrical shock to the patient. It is going to be uncomfortable. So if the patient is conscious, this is going to be one of the worst experience, getting electrocuted maybe 60 to 70 times per minute. So patient needs very adequate general sedation. Right, so you can use midazolam for that purpose. And then the step two is to turn on the monitor and set it to the PSM mode. So this is a defibrillator monitor and you have to put this monitor into the PSM mode, pacing mode, right. And then you need to select the pacing rate. So using the rate button, which is here, so you generally you go for a rate around 60 to 70 beats per minute, which is adequate. And then step four would be to increase the current output. So you start from minimal until the capture is achieved. So you go to the current output now, and then you start from the minimal current, and then you gradually increase until you get a capture. So what is meant by capturing is something like this. So once the capture is there, you might get a bit of a bizarre looking QRS complexes, complexes because the conduction is not through the SA node to AV node to the bundle of his, but it's from another abnormal type of uh, uh, conduction. Therefore, you will see some bizarre complexes, but the rate will be at the level that what we have set. Right, so once there is electrical capturing, make sure that you feel the pulse and confirm the mechanical capture. Because sometimes there may be electrical capturing, you can see the electrical activity, but there may not be, uh, the ventricular contraction may not be there, right? Therefore, you need to confirm the mechanical capture, right? And transvenous spacing is another thing that you can do instead of transcutaneous spacing, but that needs a bit of experience, but it is again a simple measure where you have a pacing generator and you have a transvenous pacing catheter, which you uh, introduce it through a sheet introducer. And then you proceed the transvenous pacing catheter until it touches the right ventricle. This can be confirmed either from a cardiac monitor or by using a C arm. And then you can place the pacing catheter there and connect it to a pacing generator and set the appropriate current, right? So what is the prognosis? So in inferior mice, there is ischemia to the conduction system, the SA node and AV node, but usually they carry a good prognosis. So you put the patient on a temporary pacemaker, after a few days, you may be able to switch it off and see whether the heart is got back his own rhythm, right? In that case, you can remove the temporary pacemaker. But following the extensive anterior MI, if the patient gets a heart block, that indicates a poorer prognosis and patient may need a permanent pacemaker, right? So that's about 
how to manage a symptomatic bradycardia in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. So let me take you to the patient number two, that is Mr. Pereira. Again, coming with ischemic type chest pain for three hours, anti acute anterior myocardial infarction. PCI is not available, so he has been thrombolyzed with tenectabase. So soon after the thrombolysis, you get a call from a worried nurse. Doctor, I think Mr. Pereira is having a VT. Well, post him my VT as expected because heart is very irritable and it's an anterior myocardial infarction. You rush to the patient. So this is what you see. You see the patient is looking all right. He's happy, he's pain free. And in the cardiac monitor, yes, you can't blame the nurse because you can see broad complex regular tachycardia. So what has happened here, right? So this is called accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So you can sometimes after a thrombolysis, you can have broad complex regular tachycardia, not as high as, the rate is not as high as a ventricular tachycardia. I mean, this is very worrying when you see this ECG in the cardiac monitor, but always you got to look at the patient and if the patient is okay, the blood pressure is stable. And if he has a good pulse, this is accelerated idioventricular rhythm, which is a reperfusion arrhythmia. So a reperfusion arrhythmia, the main management is you reassure yourself, the patient and the nurse. There's nothing much to do. And that tells you that the reperfusion is happening appropriately and correctly, right? So Mr. Pereira was thrombolyzed and the next day morning, you find him more breathless. So this is what he says. He's getting gradually breathless and he could not sleep in the night due to breathlessness. He does not have any chest pain or palpitations. And then you quickly examine this patient, you find he's very tachypneic. His respiratory rate is 30. His saturation is 85% on room air and his heart rate is 120 beats per minute. And his blood pressure is 160 by 100. And he has a gallop rhythm and his lungs show basal crepitations. So what's your diagnosis? Well, he has acute pulmonary edema due to acute left ventricular failure, which is expected after an acute anterior MI. Right, so what's your management? Well, the positioning is very important. Just because this is a medical emergency, you are not going to put the patient into a bed and lie him flat and press him there to manage. No, you have to allow the patient to be in the most comfortable position for he or she, right? So if the patient wants to be sitting on the bed, he may be wanted to be propped up on the bed. And sometimes he may, he may want to put his legs down the bed. So likewise, uh, you allow the patient to be in the most comfortable position. Second thing is we need to give oxygen. And how much oxygen? Yes, yes, you have to go for the highest percentage of oxygen in this sort of a case, because this is a heart failure. So how to give 100% oxygen to a patient? Well, this is the gadget we use. So this is a face mask with the non-rebreathing bag. So you need a tight fitting face mask with the non-rebreathing bag and you connect it to the oxygen and the flow rate should be somewhere around 15 liters per minute. Right. And the third thing is morphine. So morphine is a miracle drug in this sort of acute setting because it reduces pain, it reduces the patient's anxiety, and it has venodilatory properties which improves the pulmonary edema. So it has to be given intravenously, not subcutaneously. And you should use a generous dose of morphine, right? So in this sort of a scenario, if the patient is 75 kilos, you can go for 7.5 milligrams of intravenous morphine, right? And then it need to be given with antiemetics like metoclopramide. And then the drug of choice in acute pulmonary edema is frusamide, right? So you need to check the blood pressure. It will be a bit cautious because frusamide might drop the blood pressure. It is given intravenously and you can either give as repeated boluses or you can put the patient on, and frusam on a frusamide infusion. And there's no much of a difference between boluses and the infusion. But sometimes if the blood pressure is in the lower side, 
infusion might be a better option because it might not dramatically lower the blood pressure. Right. And then, what is the place for nitroglycerin? Well, that's a good drug. It dilates vessels. It reduces the afterload. It's good for the heart. But it depends on the blood pressure. Right. So you give it as an infusion. It has phenodilatory properties, particularly helpful in patients with hypertensive heart failure. Right. Now, you assume that you have a patient where the lungs are congested. Patient is in pulmonary edema, but blood pressure is also low. So in that sort of a scenario, you can use inotropes, something like dobutamine, to get the blood pressure up. And then you can try GTN to dilate the pulmonary vessels and to get the lungs cleared. Right. So always while managing the patient. So you have given, you have positioned the patient, you have given him oxygen, you have given him morphine, frusamide, and you have started the patient on a GTN infusion. So while managing this patient, you need to look for a cause. So a 12 DCG to look for a new ischemic event, troponins, hemoglobin, creatinine and blood urea, and if available, a point of care echo will be very useful to look for a cause. Well, if the patient is not improving, we can consider this option, which is called non-invasive ventilation, where we give the continuous positive airway pressure to keep the alveoli open and to improve the heart failure or improve the pulmonary deep. Right. So that brings to the end of my presentation. So today, we have discussed after acute myocardial infarction, three common presentations. The first one is symptomatic bradycardia, how you will manage it. And the second one is a broad complex rhythm in the cardiac monitor with a stable patient, what we call accelerated idioventricular rhythm, where the patient needs reassurance. And thirdly, after anti AMI, if the patient becomes breathless with clinical features, suggestive of acute pulmonary edema, how to do the emergency management, right? So thank you very much for your listening and let us meet again with another educational video. Have a good day.